Perfect. Um, so my name is uh, Jamie Rennie. I'm the Senior Manager of Facility and Operations out at the University of British Columbia. I just want to thank everyone for, for coming on board. I recognize some faces and names from our last time we met about a month ago. And uh, obviously lots has changed. Lots has changed uh, across the country and across the world. And um, an opportunity for us to chat a little bit about where we're at and what we're doing and hopefully share some of those experiences um, to benefit others uh, doing the same kind of work. So um, I'll just, I'll kick things off. Um, if you do have a question, if you want to throw it in the chat, I'll try to uh, try to get to it. If I'm, if I'm not seeing it, then please don't hesitate just to jump in and, uh, and fire off a question or a comment. Um, where are we at at UBC? Well, obviously in the last month, uh, like I'm sure a lot of you have been doing, uh, gathering information, trying to gather best practices. And, and here in BC, um, the government has just opened up what they called phase two, uh, which is basically restaurants, uh, fitness facilities, um, personal care uh, facilities, uh, hairdressers, nail salons, physio, those kind of things. Um, but in the meantime, we've been developing a return to activity training and sport plan, uh, working in conjunction with our recreation and athletics department, as well as our varsity teams and coaches to try to um, have a plan that can be then approved by our local health authority to be implemented and, and open up. Um, within that plan, where two main pieces of it are, is a, a work safety plan, which is basically to ensure that our staff are safe when they come back to work and different protocols we want to put in place. Um, a cleaning plan, um, you know, the, the more frequent cleaning of those touch points and, and making sure we have processes in place. And a lot of that also is to try to uh, gain the confidence back in our in our customers, uh, both outside and within our university uh, uh, community. Um, sorry about that. The um, we formed a number of uh, work groups uh, looking at uh, facility plans and creating uh, traffic flows throughout our facilities. Um, we have another group that's looking at emergency and first aid, as, as of course protocols really have to change when it comes to attending uh, to first aid. Uh, communications obviously and, and one thing we're looking at now that we've seen a couple of restaurants do is a video uh, that basically gives our end user uh, uh, you know a quick view of what it's going to look like when they come to our facilities when they come into our spaces and what are they going to see so it doesn't scare them it doesn't put them catch them off guard um, staff return to work as I, as I mentioned and then obviously the cleaning protocols so this is all being formulated right now. We're hoping to you know, take it for approvals in the next couple of weeks. Um, right now we don't have a plan to open anything prior to the end of June, um, but we're definitely being uh, asked quite a bit by Varsity and, and with our local community uh, asking to get into our facilities. In the, on the side of arenas, we have a number of our private arenas in the Vancouver area that have opened up. Um, and so when our user groups, uh, our third party users are seeing that, they're really pushing at us to, uh, to open up uh, those facilities. Um, we've been sourcing all various pieces of equipment and supplies and PPE and building the plexiglass shields for the, for the counters. Um, so we're, I think we're well on our way. And when we do come to getting, you know, looking for approval from our health authority, it will be just a rubber stamp. I think we're, we're, we're well on our way. We're, we're probably at the same space that our local cities and municipalities are at, to be honest with you. We're, we're all kind of at that same, same position. Our private facilities have opened up, but uh, the municipal ones or recreation departments are all in a similar, similar area. So that's kind of us at UBC in a, in a quick nutshell. And, um, more than welcome to uh, hear who, who else is uh, actually there's a question on here who's building their own shields and who is going with professional installer here at UBC we've just built our own uh, we're they're 40 inch uh, quarter inch Lexan 40 inch by 48 inch and we've just built a, a leg uh, two legs for them to sit on so they're not mounting to a counter they're just sitting on top of the counters um, and we've just taken that on ourselves it was a huge cost savings and we're just using our Lexan supplier that we use for our arena board uh, advertising um, for that. So I'll stop talking and uh, if anyone else wants to jump in and, and uh, give us an update on where they're at. Can I just ask a question first? Sure. Um, I'm just wondering if your campus is 
um, like fully opening for the fall semester or if classes are online? Yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a hybrid uh, here at UBC, but um, that obviously will have an impact on our facilities opening, financial impact, hours of operation impact, um, staffing impact and trying to find student staff. That's something we're we're dealing with right now and trying to get uh, the plans are in place or get moving towards in place, but getting uh, getting staff that can actually work in the facilities if they're doing their courses online. That's actually a good segue because that was going to be my question. So we are going blended as of now at Western in the fall, which is online and in person. Um, so they're trying to find new spaces to hold classes. And we found out that REC is going to be one of those spaces um, that's currently on the table for discussion. So looking at um, closing our six gyms, our drop-in gyms, and being able to house about 150 to 200 students um, in each of those floors. So we have three on the top and three on the bottom. So is anyone else uh, experiencing this right now in their uh, institutions? And how are you going to navigate the conversation of rec fees when we really can't offer much? Queens announced their, they think they're going to go primarily online. Um, they think uh, that that's a safe decision, but they are expecting a lot of students to still make their way back to Kingston, regardless of whether they're learning online or not. So um, I haven't heard about the uh, gym thing, although it doesn't surprise me. Um, uh, kind of the, what they're doing with residences is they're kind of thinking they can accommodate 20% of their, uh, of their uh, cohort in, uh, in residences. So, um, but Hopefully I don't hear that they want the gyms for, for uh, classrooms. UBC Okanagan is also still retains their gymnasium. We haven't given it up yet. They haven't asked us for it yet, but we also only have the one facility to offer. So definitely limited spacing there. Um, and yeah, looking at a hybrid, but primarily online with very few uh, upper level and labs that are being offered in person at this time. Yeah, I would say here at Saskatchewan Polytech, we're probably the same as UBCO. Um, and we've kind of given or gotten uh, the direction that we won't be able to open any of our facilities or gymnasiums, um, fitness centers, any of that stuff if we're not going to have students. So that's where we're at right now. Yeah, we're, it's looking like our six gyms and then also our, acad our varsity facility, like our varsity gym, um, as well as the teacher's college gym as well. So they're kind of going across campus. There's a big push um, at Western to get uh, students on campus because their concern is if we don't get the first years on campus, then they're going to defer a year and cycle, 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 right? Each year that there'll be kind of a double cohort again. Um, so I just wasn't sure if anybody else was in the boat. I hadn't heard of anybody, but I was looking for some friends in my party here. I would say for us, I don't think it's off the table because we have a decent amount of gym space to to give the university if they ever wanted it, but we haven't heard that directly. Um, so similar to comments made, we're, we're primarily going online and it's been announced by the institution, but um, there will be some uh, on-site labs uh, and I'm going to guess research master's level um, back on site. Um, but uh, I would say our institution's looking for, for creative ways to, to do the same thing, Jenna, to try and keep as many students engaged to, to not lose the year. So um, it wouldn't surprise me if that comes out in the next week or so, if, we're, if we start evaluating space on campus and definitely we have the most space to offer. Anyone else on that uh, on that topic of online uh, versus uh, using recreation spaces for classrooms? Okay. The um, one other thing, uh, obviously, we're doing is looking at purchasing equipment, um, different types of equipment. We're reviewing electrostatic foggers, uh, UV um, handheld devices. 
anyone looking at those types of equipment for their weight room or fitness facilities? Um, at the end of the day, we, we already have one. Um, it's currently not working, but we can we need to get it fixed. But the uh, product itself, we are trying to plan how to use that. I do, from talking in our daily team meeting, I believe our purchasing department at the university is considering something like that, but they're, um, they're still in investigation, but we're a little bit behind you guys. Like, there hasn't been any online, there hasn't been any definite announcement made for the U of W yet, but, but yeah, we, we will be looking at things like that. I just posted, we have one Clorox 360 and we've ordered two more. We got two in McMaster. Uh, we use a product called Ultralight from Centaur Products. Uh, we've been using them for a little over a year now. Um, so we, were, we just ordered some additional to try and keep up with some stuff. And are those, uh, the Ultralight, are those, uh, is it a wand or is it an electrostatic fogger type unit from Centaur? Uh, the fogger is uh, from uh, Dynafog itself. The Ultralight is the actual disinfectant product. Okay. Um, which they put out, it's, it's meant for hospitals and foods, uh, food services and things like that. Um, we actually, we found again, COVID's new, but uh, we found a reduction in things like Impetigo and stuff since we started fogging more with those. And you guys have been using it prior to this COVID outbreak? Yeah, we had one yeah. for about a year. Uh, we started it about a year ago. We, we were getting a lot of particularly rugby and, and wrestling and stuff like that, some, some Impetigo the high contact sports and we found, so we, we went in this direction and then found that to be fairly good. And so we just have updated and purchased some more. I know I keep seeing the Clorox 360, our facility services carries uh, a couple of those as well. Then they are our main custodial on campus. Yeah, can I ask, can I ask a question to the group? Um, I think from a procurement standpoint, are our custodial groups looking at buying more? There's, we have currently have one Clorox 360 for our building, um, but I think Custodial is going to take on looking at getting more. Are the ones that like Queen says they have three and the other units, are those specific only for rec and, rec and athletics or are they shared across to other parts of the university? Because I'm, I'm worried that we're going to be in a shared model and then we're going to be like, where is it? Or it breaks somewhere else, that kind of stuff. So are, are they separate or, or shared? They are Ours not. Yeah, our mine are, are mine as well. So everybody has, that has that 360, is it worth purchasing or is there something else? Like, do you guys think it works well or is there something else maybe to purchase instead? We had one of the old handheld foggers and this is light years ahead of that. Um, just from, even just fatigue from using it. Um, it, the product, it, we had an Impetigo, uh, football in football two seasons ago, and it was, uh, really invaluable for that. Uh, it's very easy for our staff to use. Um, uh, the spray is controlled very well. So, um, that's why we've, we've got uh, two more on the way. So. Dwayne, do you require... Are you required to clean the space before disinfecting it? Like if you have oils or debris built up on a product on a on, on free weights or something like that, do you need we to? Don't. You don't. No, we don't. We uh, we will miss. And, and our current schedule was we would disinfect the like the free weights once a week, and we would do the combatives mat daily, and we would do uh, selectorized machines once a week that's going to be up depending on what I figure out for a reopening schedule and whether we're going to have like a building clear and, and full disinfect and stuff. Um, but we also have uh, percept and rags all over the building for people to do wipe downs as well. So there's probably not a lot of buildup that way. Um, and I think that's going to increase significantly. Um, people are going to be looking for that cleaner to clean their equipment before they use it and after hopefully. This is Nino here from Ryerson. 
Um, we've been looking into the electrostatic sprayers as well. Something to make note of, um, I don't know if this language or the actual product some people are talking about. There's misters, there's foggers, there's electrostatic sprayers. If you're looking for better disinfection, look to purchase electrostatic sprayers. They are more expensive, but the science behind that is that the particle is sprayed out of the wand with an electrostatic charge and so the particles will stick to the surface and actually move around the surface and not just stick to the surface that was sprayed. So if you're spraying a pop can, for example, you're not just getting the front of the pop can. It's going to get the top, the back, the sides, the bottom, because the product will move around because of the difference in positive and negative charges. Uh, the machines are expensive. They range from 1500 bucks to 6000 bucks US. Depends what you get. And they have different, um, different functions, whether you get the Victory unit, the Clorox, the E-Mist, looked into all those three products. There's handhelds, there's backpacks, there's ones on carts. Um, careful with the chemical you're buying for it. Not all chemicals can be electrostatically charged, apparently. Looking at battery charge versus corded. Looking at some machines can do 23,000 square feet per hour. Some do 18,000 square feet per hour. Some can do 54,000 square feet per hour. It depends on how much product comes out of the nozzle, um, how big the particles are, how small the particles are matter as well. So there's a bunch of things to look at or consider when purchasing these. Feedback from all different brands are, is varied. It's varied. So we're not sure exactly which ones to get yet ourselves, but we're hoping to buy them soon. Hope that helps. Any other comments with regards to foggers, sprayers, electrostatic, UV? Anything like that? Okay. Um, what uh, What's everyone? Does anyone have a timeline of, for opening? Is there? Is it still up in the air? Is are people building their plans right now? Where is everyone kind of positioned for getting back to uh, somewhat of a new normal? So we're, I'm, my eyes hurt from writing policies and all that kind of stuff right now. Um, I've been working on our reopening plan primarily. Uh, we are going to be doing some fields um, in the near future, uh, outdoor spaces in alignment with what the city of Kingston has done and what the government has said is permitted. Um, a lot of signage around individual use no games, no teams, uh, social distancing required, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have no timeline for our indoor facilities at this point, uh, but I've been spending my time, uh, got the CAD drawings of our building and trying to move all the squares around of, of 100 square feet per person and how many people can you fit in a studio, how many people can you fit in a, in a free weight area, and then trying to figure out how we control that. Is that what you're using, Dwayne, 100 square feet per person? Is that kind of a guideline in Ontario? So I don't know if it's an official guideline. I've heard anywhere, like currently the Ontario regulation for social distancing is six feet, which is kind of, you can look at it two ways. You can look at it six feet each side, which would be 144 square feet or just 36. Um, I've been, and I, miss, I misspoke, I've been using the 144 um, going six feet each way. Um, there's another guideline that I've read where for physical activity, you should be using 10 foot social distancing instead of six. So uh, I'm, I'm building on the worst case scenario of 144 square feet per person. Uh, some of our spaces are like our spin studio is four people could fit in it. So then I'm looking at, do we move uh, our spin studio into one of our dance studios so we can have 10 people in a spin class instead of four? Um, and then I've got three cases of vinyl tape sitting in my office to start laying out squares once, uh, once we figure that out and, uh, and get uh, 
an idea of what the rules are going to be. But we have we have no firm timeline at all. The local uh, the grocery stores here in the province work on a 53 square foot uh, space per person, five meters squared, and so we've been trying to find a, a number somewhere in and around that. Uh, when we think about how many people we can put on the ice or, or put in a space. We've also got restrictions to no groups greater than 50 um, in a space. So we've got some halls to rent out for weddings and obviously receptions are going to be downsized considerably. So anyone else working on a square foot per person that they'd like to share? Uh, sorry, John Toledo and I have been in our, our fitness center and we have spaced out six feet for all of our equipment. So we were like, so we have six plus between all of our weight room equipment and we hold actually we, well, we had some old weight equipment that we wanted to get rid of anyway, or we're still hoping to, but it's all been moved out of the space and in the studio that we're storing it. We uh, out, mar made six foot markers, had our physical plant move things. Um, and we were able to do that as well in our cardio space. Uh, we'll be closing down machines and now, we also realize everything we did, there might still be more that we might have to do in there, whether it's still closed or spread them further if we have to. But at least we were able to get our step one. Um, her and I have been doing the majority of our, our plan. We don't have a set date yet for a plan or for our return to work, but it is like the concept is we could be going back anytime, but I, we've also been told we may not be going back minutes open until September, but with, things opening up now there might be a lot of pressure and I mean we got our first question in today we heard that things are going to be opening up soon are you guys going to be opening up too so we know the questions are going to come so we're just waiting for the university to kind of tell us where we fall into that so we can get a an idea Trisha how many people would that would you fit in your fitness center now and what's the square footage of it um we have well our, our capacity is uh, 60. That's that's without this. So we're looking at 30 people, 1,000 um, square feet. But we're looking on our main floor. We measured it out. And like there's a lot of equipment, so we still have to go out and tape our main floor because it's fairly crowded and we'll have to close some machines. But there we're going to allow just five people on our main, which is our, our main uh, free weight and uh, – you know, the, the strength racks and everything is there. So that's going to be five people total there on our second floor. It's much more spread out. So our weight machines, we can allow about 12 in our cardio area, <laughs> narrow hallway mostly, but it's uh, about 12 people or 13. So that's kind of how we've decided our, we can probably fit one or two more people on our main floor, but it might be better because people still have to travel to get there and there's a lot of equipment. So I think it's better to do a little bit less. And so, yeah, that's our 50% of capacity. Um, so that's kind of what we're going with for now anyway. Okay. Any other comments about square footage per person, what anyone's working on or some people not quite there? Uh, UPCO, we just mapped it out really quickly. So our 4,000 square foot facility, and we're down to about 25 people once you take into account uh, the space limited by furniture, equipment, et cetera. Okay. Any other comments from anyone on that? Can you just explain how you get the 144 square foot per person number? Yeah, so if, if I am standing in the middle of a square and I have six feet to my left and six feet to my right, that's a total of 12 feet. And then six feet in front of me, six feet behind me, so I always have six feet away from people, that square is actually 12 by 12. Gotcha. Thank you. No problem. Okay, no other comments there. Um, I'm curious about training for staff uh, when staff start to come back. Something we're we're starting to look at in our plan, and if anyone's given that any thought, or is at that point where they're considering what type of training they'll have to um, additionally provide for their staff when dealing with uh, with COVID in, in our environment, and and how 
we do things a little bit differently. I think the big thing is just going to be drilling into them that it's not just a quick wipe down of a, of a treadmill console. It's got to be every square inch of that surface. Um, and drilling that into, into staff is, is it can't just be get through it as quick as possible uh, is one important factor. Yeah, I think I, I, read, I read somewhere that is in, in someone other facilities plan is don't assume that they're gonna do it, be there, be on top of them, make sure, because I mean, I'm hoping that they've seen what's going on around them and they get it, but it was like pulling teeth to get them to do it before, so I, I'm going to assume that the same rule is going to apply here, even though we all know it's important, but yeah, we'll all have to be there on top of them supervising it first and now we do it like this. <laughs> it's good to know that everyone else has the same problem with the cleaning and <laughs> yeah. students are students, whether they're in BC or Prince Edward Island. <laughs> I'm also concerned about, you know, what I see happening in the grocery stores. A number of them have arrows on the floor and have it all floor taped and, and everyone just goes everywhere. There's no, and yet there's no one, uh, the odd grocery store has a security guard, but even at that, they're pretty quiet. There's no, um, there's no education being provided to, to those that are shopping and, and people are going up the wrong aisle and getting upset and, and, uh, so we're just looking at it from obviously bringing on probably more staff to assist with just directional as much as we'll have signage, but bringing on more staff just to have that human element in providing some, uh, some information and education around the, around the facility. We're looking at that as well, like having somebody basically on full-time cleaning and then somebody, what I'm going to call member management and trying to direct traffic and yeah, add education in as well. So um yeah looking to hire more staff if we have them <laughs> i see some uh, some questions in the chat one around change rooms and lockers do has anyone at that point where they're working on a, a plan to not have lockers open or not have change rooms or how are they scheduling people in to use their locker rooms uh you know one hour swims and then kind of get in get out any comments around that? I'll jump in, Jamie, just because I was the one that kind of started that uh, conversation. So we're looking, well, right now, um, going to the previous comment, we are not really planning to reopen at this point until we have a decision around academics because we don't want to go through and put everything into a new place when we won't be able to use our facility. So sorry, I have a puppy that's pushing my laptop here. Um, so we are going to wait on that. But our decision was if we open, we won't use our change rooms. And I was just saying um, it also will impact the aquatics because based on the health unit standards, you have to have a warm shower and soap before entering the pool. And we see everybody does exactly that before their swim. Um, so, so that was one thing um, that we're noticing is that we're going to have to close those off because you also can't guarantee a wipe down of lockers after they've been used or anything like that. Um, so closing those areas off, but allowing access to the bathrooms. Um, so having staff there to monitor that. And then my question, part B of that is, what are people doing with locker cleanouts? Because right now we are having a heck of a time um, trying to get people their things because no one's allowed in the facility and I don't want to go the campus police route and having them escort people in because I need them on my good side. Um, but that's kind of a concern we have is we have about 650 lockers that are currently rented with people needing items to run outside or to go swimming in their swimming pool at home. So just thought I'd see if anybody's found a happy medium solution there. We did an online request form, just like your online shopping, so they can request their items. We will bag them, and then we have pickup times throughout the week that they can come and uh, get their stuff. So we're not even allowed in the building. That would be a problem. So that's kind of where we're, I'm pushing and pushing Steve, our facility manager, to try and let us get in for that. Um, it's obviously senior admin at the university who are making that decision, but my question on that Dwayne is then how if they come back and they're like oh my $200 pair of shoes I know we're in there aren't in the bag how are you going to handle that because that's one of my concerns we are listing everything as we take them out and writing it right on the bag for them that's everything and it's two staff members that are doing it 
Um, we haven't had that situation come up yet, thankfully, um, but it's like, it is what it is. We have security cameras that you can watch people coming out of the locker room. So if there's ever a question, then you can see if someone comes out with one of those items, but yeah, I don't see that as a problem. We were wondering if we set up a Zoom and then have them in the waiting room. So when it's their turn, they can watch us, like we'll add them to the meeting and then they can watch us pack it and then we like take it outside to them. But again, this feels very childish, I wanna say, and a lot more work than we need to do. So it's just my concern, like covering staff butts, right? That we know there is going to be that one or two people potentially that come back and say, you know, this was missing and I know it was in there or whatever, so. I think, I think the butt is covered by having a university staff doing it. Because I think if you're like university staff are doing it, uh, and, and you know, and, and I don't necessarily, and maybe it's not your student staff, maybe it's a slightly higher up staff that's doing it to provide that. So then I think it, I think it just has to be that that's the way it is. But we've, we've been lucky enough to have our security on board. They've been escorting any, any people who want to pick up their items now or during this time, they would email us, we email them, letting them know they can contact security, then they have to go down campus and security will walk them in but something that we were realizing and actually we were talking about today is that through all of this if any of them have been exposed I don't know if there's any screen that goes on in screening that goes on before they take them into the locker room or if there's any cleaning going on in the locker rooms because really I don't think the security stays with them when they're in there so a couple of things to look into but I think people have been happy they've been able to get their stuff um i don't think we were we were just talking about this today in the midst of our reopening plan is if we're going to have our locker rooms open or not it is suggested the province of manitoba just released their information today for their requirements so it's suggested that they be closed a lot of people are leaving their their washroom facilities open but in our space, it's all one. Like, there's no way of blocking it off. So unless we had a extra staff person designated and only staying in the locker room to watch people, make sure they're just getting their stuff and leaving or using the bathroom, then I think we'll probably make ours closed. I'm not really sure yet, but that's that'll be a group discussion with a few more people. Hey guys, um, I could jump in, uh, Craig at the University of Ottawa. Um, it's awesome. What I'm noticing is, is everybody has a different approach, uh, really from the different parts of the country that they're in, because uh, different parts of the country are at different stages as we're going on. Uh, even here in Ontario, we got Jenna from Western, and we got uh, Queen's University. I know Kingston, um, it's a lot different in Kingston than it is perhaps in, in Toronto and Ottawa and how they're affected with everything. But um, we have the same situation. We have about 700 lockers that are full right now. Um, what I recommend is, is bringing that to the attention of the people who are making the decisions. Maybe if you're getting emails from requests from clients and stuff like that, and just package it up for them, a neat little summary. You know, we've had 100 people ask in the last week or so. Uh, maybe start thinking of a plan for them to get their items back. Um, surely you must have a procedure in place when it comes to emptying out those lockers at the end of the year like we do. Um, you know, we have 10% of people who never come back to get their stuff. And we have a procedure like two people... We, we document and everything, which could be challenging because you don't want two people doing that right now to empty out people's lockers. I think my approach and the approach that I'm going to recommend on our side is you give people the choice. If, if they're asking to come on campus and stuff, first off, you see if that's a possibility for them to come and get it. And then you ask them for their permission to go into their lockers and you use that as a sort of a waiver form or, you know, if they say something is missing, well, you gave me permission to go into your locker. This is the only way we can get you your stuff. And hopefully... Nowadays, people are more understanding than usual with that kind of stuff. Really, at the end of the day, it's no different than if uh, if one of our facility coordinators stayed after we closed and went into their locker. It's really not any different than that. So, um, and That's we went right. with we went with the contactless pickup. So they pick, they fill out the form, we bag it, they come, they sign their sheet, uh, their request form, actually. We put the bag on a table. They pick the bag up and go on about their merry way. So, yeah, we, yeah, we and if, if there's a loss of item, 
I'm sorry. I was just going to say, if there's a loss of items or something, they have a claim that something's missing. Well, then you just bring them through the normal channels of the contact protection services or, you know, the police or whatever it is that you guys do when there's uh, items missing. And, and, you know, sometimes you just got to take that route, I guess. Yeah. We also have all our, all our, our post policy in our locker rooms is that we're not responsible for lost, stolen or missing property. So we're yeah. a little bit covered in that sense as well. Um, but we, we tried to do the same thing, Dwayne, with, uh, curbside pickup our, our university didn't want the liability even on that um, really? yeah um, so it's it's been a challenge I know Dave's on the call with us too but we we are we're getting consistently bombarded with I need to get my stuff you know someone left their $1,700 MacBook in a locker two months ago but that's their own fault yeah so the way we look at it as well but um, but yeah I don't know how many guys have that policy posted up and around because we we have, with us having, I'm sure you all have had thefts and stuff as well. Um, we, we make sure that policy is up and posted where everyone can see it. Yeah. We haven't had a big undertaking. We've had 60 people that took advantage of it. Um, but a lot of students also cleaned their stuff out before they left campus. So, um, but 60, 60 happy customers is 60 happy customers. Any other uh, comments? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just to follow up on, on I guess, what uh, Craig was talking about, uh, we're, we've done something kind of similar. Um, we're still in the works of finalizing um, our procedures uh, for allowing people to come in and book a very small time slot to pick up their items from the locker. Uh, before this, we have had uh, a large number of students coming in um, and being escorted by security to grab their items. So, I mean, from the original 500 or so lockers that were full, we might be down to maybe 400. I'm not too sure. Um, so hopefully in the coming weeks, we will have uh, our uh, procedures set in place and we can actually start um, clearing out these lockers uh, with one student at a time. We're trying to get flow through the building uh, just in one direction, out uh, one end and, or sorry, in one end and out the other with as minimal amount of touching as possible. So our procedures have been going back and forth a lot with occupational health and safety um, and different messaging groups uh, through our institution. And I guess I should have mentioned, I'm, uh, my name is Melissa and I'm um, from BCIT. Excellent. Any other comments from anyone with regards to lockers, uh, collection of lockers, change rooms? Anything that anyone wants to throw out there as a topic to get some more information on or to bat around with the group? I just wondered if, if people are into their reopening plans, are you, are, are people looking at ongoing cleaning throughout use or are people looking at allowing people to come in for an hour, an hour and a half, and then clearing the building, doing a full clean and then letting another group come in? Yeah, actually, I was going to ask, uh, Nino, because he had met, we're, we're looking at, uh, he had posted in the group chat that they were doing an hour and a half, 90 minute bookings. We're, we're conceptually looking at 90 minute bookings, then closing for an hour to do a full clean. Um, if we can shorten that time down over a period of time, I think we'll start with that full hour to clean and reset because we really don't know how long it's going to take. And I believe we're going to be having one of the, uh, professional or the B clean staff helping us go through this staff but or through the center, but we should have two or three staff going through. But I think it's, we'll have to, we'll have to try to go through it ourselves somewhat to see how long it's going to take as well. This is oh, Nick. here. Yeah, we're in the same boat where I did have 30 minutes initially and this, today I changed our plan to 45 minutes for cleaning time. And we're gonna stick to that. And if we need more time, we'll just have more staff. A lot of our full-time staff that operate or run or coordinate intramurals, drop-in sports, events, clubs, none of those things are running or pool. So the full-time coordinators will have time to help the facilities and customer service staff to do the cleaning in those intervals. So we're probably looking at seven or eight or nine staff to clean all the fitness and cardio equipment. 
especially all the high touch points in those intervals. Well, that's good to know. Thank you. Studios will be closed, pools closed. So there's not a lot of places to clean. It's just you Sorry, did you say you're opening your like basketball courts and stuff right away? No, uh, we're okay. going to move fitness equipment into them to space the fitness equipment around. Okay. So bikes and rowers, things that are more easily movable, we'll put into the gymnasium. Strength equipment, the machines, the sectorized machines can go on the, in the gymnasium floor. Free weights, kettlebells, bars, plates, all that stuff stays in the fitness center. So we don't dent the hardwood floors in the gymnasiums. That's the plan so far anyways. I don't think we have anyone on from, uh, from here at UBC with regards to the weight room uh, fitness or, or aquatics, but I know in the arenas, um, we're looking at having uh, groups come in for probably an hour, but in a group setting, we don't, it wouldn't be more than six people at a time. And then we would space them out probably 30 minutes after each, each user to clean the, the team room. <coughs> Washrooms in the team rooms and showers would be closed, but uh, we give the, the team room a clean and then also players benches uh, give those a clean before the next group comes in. So um, that's, that's kind of what we're looking at. I'm not sure what we're, our, our fitness staff and uh, aquatic staff are building their plans as to how that would look as well. Anyone else at that point of looking at uh, timelines for people usage or cleaning timelines being allotted for spaces? Anyone at the point of looking at um, rentals and insurance for those for those third party groups? Um, the only thing I would offer, we have a, a group insurance that we actually sell if groups don't have their own insurance. And um, our on-campus risk manager uh, informed us that that insurance company has put an exclusion in around any COVID or, or uh, pathogen illness or injury. So uh, just be aware of that. And if you're asking for insurance certificates from people, make sure that uh, they are asked for any exclusions for it from their insurance coverage. And if there is listed an exclusion from COVID, then you've got to have some good mitigation strategies um, for that activity, such as they've got a screen for temperature and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're in the same position, Dwayne, with, with that, is that's kind of where we're at right now. It's just working with risk on, on um, how, we can, how we can deal with that. Anybody else, any other institutions at that point of looking at third party rentals and insurance exclusions with COVID? The only rentals we're looking at right now is for the arena for hockey. I'm um, just yeah. trying to make some of the money back, but we currently have sand under our ice. Um, so just determining if it's best now, since we've um, taken the ice out to pour concrete and be able to use it um, for different things coming up in the future. Um, but again, we're looking at that is, do we have people coming in their hockey attire or are we um, providing two dressing rooms per team now instead of one and looking at the spacing for that and then having an hour in between each rental to fully clean everything down again. So that's the only thing we're even looking remotely considering. I'm just posting in the chat the language that our risk manager and I kind of agreed on um, for when people are signing a rental agreement. If it's helpful for people, good for you. Can I ask why it sounds like hockey arenas seem to be maybe the outlier right now that people are making a little bit more progress on? Like we don't have an arena on campus. Um, hopefully in the future we do, but... Currently we don't, but it sounds like hockey, maybe just because of Canadian flair, is getting a little bit more of the exactly uh, what <laughs> the the, the, pass, the, the pass and go here. But um, with contact and contact sports, I know there's a lot of 
you know, dialogue out there and, and research starting on what that looks like with droplets. And um, I think someone referred to it today. Um, there's some studies about even when you're working out, it, do those droplets tr like move further? So should the distance be 10 feet, I think Duane was, was saying earlier. So I know when it comes to rentals for us, as soon as uh, the premier mentioned last week that sport fields could kind of resume, we did get a lot of action, people looking for uh, rentals of our of our fields but as of right now we're not taking any rentals um, we're kind of sticking to the university's position on being closed and uh, aligning ourselves with that right now but um, I guess just more curiosity for me like what's the what's the safety on hockey versus the safety on taking rentals for for rugby or for something else well I think Dwayne and I were on the same page where we're saying it's the money of the rental like we're having we Steve said on our, our department meeting call this morning that he's having people email and be like, I'll literally pay $400 an hour just to get back on the ice. Um, so for us, if we can make some of the revenue up, especially if we're going to be losing our student fee, like we lost it for the summer, we don't know what's going to happen yet with the fall um, because of the potential academic courses coming in. But that's a place for us to make a little bit of money up. It's also a separate facility. Um, so it's not... I don't know. I don't, I want to say people are covered in equipment because they have the face shield potentially, but it's a little bit safer in my eyes than someone we've all seen the girls in the weight room who walk around in their sports bras and little shorts. And I feel a hockey equipment covers a bit more and is a bit more protected than someone sweating in the weight room. But that's my personal opinion. But again, I think for us, our big thing is looking at the revenue generation. Are you putting any rules in that it must be non-contact hockey? Not my ballpark, um, but I can get back to you on that. So Colin, out in Vancouver, the real push has been from the private rinks. Um, a lot of them are membership based and, you know, everyone wants to get their kid on the ice because they're going to be in the NHL in, you know, five years. So these guys are renting the ice out at 250 to 300 an hour, but there's only a maximum of, of four some rinks are four, some are six. I think the highest I seen was eight allowed on the ice at one time. And so it's basically skills and drills. Um, there's no competitive game portion to that. Um, and it is definitely financially driven when it comes to those private rinks. Um, I think almost every private rink now in the lower mainland is open uh, as well as the private clubs have got at least one sheet open. Some of them have, uh, six sheets or four sheets um, in full swing, but they've only got one or two open at this time. It's definitely financially driven for us. It's, um, you know, as I said earlier, we're on the same path as a lot of the municipal rinks and city rinks. None of those have opened or even considered. Um, and we've, we've had a little bit of demand from those that want to pay the, the 250 an hour to come out just with their son or daughter uh, or maybe two or three kids but it would be under pretty strict um, processes to get in. Um, one of the examples I saw yesterday was they allowed four in at a time. The door was locked at the front of the arena. They were met by a staff person. The staff person brought them in one at a time. In the dressing room, there was assigned four areas that were labeled uh, with numbers. They even labeled the water trough in the, in, the, uh, in the bench where they put your water bottles. Those were named, labeled one to four for the players to put their bottles in. And then they had a spot on the glass inside the arena where they, they all went to individually as they were being brought out to then uh, work with their coach. So there's some pretty strict guidelines in it, but definitely none of it is full contact. Um, none of it is in a competition kind of mode. It's basically skills and drills um, from, from that standpoint. So uh, we've had some masks from our varsity hockey team and kind of when things are getting going to be getting going and, um, that's all part of our consideration as well as the financial part of opening up one. We have three arenas here. So opening up one rink, um, you know, what the cost would be to open up that one rink and will it make sense? And can we, can we get back that money through rentals? Just going back to the weight room access and stuff. How are people, are you going to have online signups or are you just going to have lineups at the door? Um, how are you going to relay that and control that to your members? Um, through our, through uh, fusion, we're setting up, uh, the 90 minute workout blocks that people will have to 
sign up for. So 30, uh, people, 30 people at a time. Is that a program? Uh, Fusion is our software program. No, sorry, are you doing that as a program registration or a schedule by offering or? I think it's a program registration. It's one of their new things they said that's coming out that we're going to be meeting with them yet, but. So yeah, in the future. Pardon, yeah. But I, but I think it's pretty much a part of her. It's very it's set up very similar to the whole to the program and check in. And then our thought is when they come in, we would have them. Uh, someone had asked about member screening um, and procedures. We we were hoping. So again, this is just what I'm thinking. But as they come in, uh, we don't have the app for our phones yet in Fusion. So, but we do have. They scan their the barcode from their student cards or membership cards. So we still have somewhat contactless entry and um, their first time in they'll have to sign on off new procedures and I think every time they come in they'll have to be screened for and the posters will be there but I think they'll have to, to be pointed to acknowledge when they come in. So. But yeah mostly we're looking at those 90 minute blocks through Fusion. We're hoping it works. Yeah, I've, I've toyed with the idea of instead of having squash court bookings online, having like signups for that thing, but I was curious whether you're doing it through a program registration or a, or a court booking or a what? I believe um, our, our, two, uh, our, our main girl who does, who really takes care of Fusion looked at the options between the two and found that if, and this was before we got the email from Fusion uh, talking about the add-on, that it was much easier to set up in, uh, in, through programs than it was through court bookings. Okay. Yeah, my question was going to be to Chris, actually. He kind of answered that, but I'd love to know what American schools have utilized it for a little bit of time and see what the wins and fusion challenges are. You know, Jenna, I, as I, I just finished typing that in the chat, and then I'm thinking back, this was a big conversation we had in the director's call two days ago that I helped facilitate, and we had Rick Hall from Texas A&M as one of the other facilitators. I'm now, after I just typed that, I'm thinking, you know what, they did the reservations, I think he said in IM leagues, not in Fusion. So, sorry if I'm misquoting that one there. But, um, but Rick Hall said very clearly, hey, anybody wants to know what our lessons learned were from us opening this Monday, give us a call, we'd love to talk to you. So I know that uh, Fogarty, I already gave him his contact information so he can, he can get a hold of Rick down there and, and find out how they did it. Jared Wilson is their um, strength and conditioning guy for uh, the fitness program at Texas A&M. He'd be, you know, obviously willing to answer the questions as well. well thanks, Chris. Uh, the question that I posed a couple of minutes ago, I, one of the concerns we have is, I mean, you guys all know about college football in America and how much money there is associated with that, similar to hockey for you guys. Um, so, it, but I think you guys play basketball in the fall and volleyball in the winter, if I remember correctly, based on our regional conference we had in Vancouver. Um, so, you know, how do you say that varsity can play basketball and have a varsity season, but we've got no contact um, and we're so or physical distancing, so you can't play basketball at intramurals. That's a question that I think some of us are going to have to answer, and that's going to be a hard one to answer. How do you play college football for varsity, but you can't have flag football in intramurals? So anyway, I don't know if anybody's got any bright ideas about that one, but I'd love to hear it if you do. I, I would think hockey would be the same. You guys all have intramural hockey. So if you had a varsity season, but you didn't have intramural hockey or your club teams couldn't play, those are going to be some tough conversations, I think. I think the only argument for it is that it's a much smaller population and, and controlled group, but I agree with you. I don't know how, how you play football with social distancing. Yeah, you don't want to be on the bottom of the pile. Unless you're like me and you run away from all the players all the time. And I think the intramurals for us are going to be mirrored off of what OUA and U Sports run. Um, and there's, to my knowledge, been no major decisions made in that area either, so. All right, as we uh, 
come up on two o'clock or two o'clock here at West anyway. Um, any other comments, any other, anything else that anyone's uh, curious about? This uh, video has been recorded. So if you want to look back at it or share it with some of your colleagues, the opportunity will be there as well. Anything else? I'm just going to repost um, the link here for anyone who missed it. Just double check which page you're signing up for um, to make sure you hit the facilities tab. I love having all these friends in aquatics, but I don't think you actually want to be in aquatics. Um, so just double check when you're signing up that you're in the facility tab there. And I, I'm pretty sure I got everybody at the start. So just kind of maybe run through your name there um, and make sure it's there. And then I'll, if you want to stay in aquatics, feel free, but I'm not sure many people do. And Chris, you're always welcome in the Canadian calls. <laughs> Jamie, thanks so much for facilitating again. Um, we appreciate no it. What we're looking at now is your June date and a facilitator. So Jamie's taken two for the team now. Um, is there anybody who wants to jump in uh, for June? And is there a specific date that you would like to, us to book you in for? I can take June. Thanks, Duane. Do you want to throw me a date? I want to date with you anytime. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, Jenna, a long time. <laughs> uh, how does, what are we, the, the third Thursday? How does the 18th of June work for people at, uh, uh, let's go at three o'clock on June the 18th? June 18th, three o'clock. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Stay safe, everybody. Enjoy the sunshine that's finally here. Awesome. And thanks again, Jamie. Great job. No problem. Take care, everyone. Stay safe, guys. Bye.